live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Oh, thanks for clapping. I got half of you to clap. That's fine. That was... No, you don't have to clap for me, but make sure you clap for our guest speaker in just a little bit once he comes up on stage, because we want him to feel really welcome so that he feels glad that he came all the way out to Raleigh on a rainy night. I'm glad all of you came out to downtown Raleigh to the museum on a rainy Thursday night. Like I always say, there's no better place to be on a Thursday night if you like science in the triangle than right here at the Science Cafe. And we're here every Thursday night learning something new about what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and we get to learn those things from really interesting people. At least I think they're interesting. We find some pretty cool people to come out and share with us about topics, well, all over the place, right? Maybe tonight's topic is going to be a little too personal. How many of you are wearing a fitness tracker? Let's see them. Hold them up high. Yeah, a few people. Well, right, they're even embedded into our smartphones now, right? Like my iPhone is tracking steps, and I don't even know if I told it it could do that. I should probably check that. Um, but I think these days, at least it seems like these days, people are pretty health conscious, right? Right, we know you diet, you exercise, and you wear your fitness tracker, right? If you wear a fitness tracker, you will be healthy, right? Okay, no. Okay, at least a few of you giggled. That means some people are getting it. Yeah, so lies, your Fitbit told you. Did you know your Fitbit could lie to you? Yeah, mine says that I only walked like 3,000 steps, and I swear I covered at least 3,500 today. And tonight's guest is looking at the way that we live our lives from an evolutionary perspective. So over time, humans have changed quite a bit. The way we live now, modern day, especially in the Western world, compared to other parts of the world and compared to our past, compared to our ancestors, is dramatically different. You know, they didn't have, you know, cheese whiz a few, a, just a, 50 years ago, right? And Cheese Whiz has dramatically changed my life and my diet. So uh, tonight we're going to dive into the history, the evolution of your Fitbit and your fitness tracker, at least a little bit, I think. And we're going to do that with Dr. Herman Ponser from Duke University. He's an associate professor of evolutionary anthropology. Put your hands together and welcome him to the Science Cafe. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to see if I can spill the beer during this presentation. I was told uh, I got an invi invitation to this fantastic venue. I uh, Thank you all for coming out. And I remember reading the email, and I got as far as beer. I was like, I'm there. <laughs> I don't care what's, uh, whatever else. Um, so yeah, my name is Herman Ponser. I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, as, uh, as Chris mentioned. And um, so you know, we're going to get into some public health topics today, some you know, metabolism and cardiometabolic health, all that stuff. And you might wonder how someone who's an evolutionary anthropologist uh, would get into those kind of topics. And the short answer is that you know, life is a game of turning energy. Oh, is it too low? Is that better? Too low, OK. Um, life is a game of turning energy into babies, right? So all evolution cares about, really, is how well you do that job. So when I study the energetics, uh, of humans and apes and other primates, how we spend our calories. And I do that because I'm really interested in where we came from, how our bodies evolved, and how they work today. So this is a, a portrait of an anthropologist as a young man. Um, that's me in grad school about 20 years ago. Uh, I, I still get a tear in my eye when I see that full head of hair. But anyway, um, this is me at a site called Demonisi in the, in the Republic of Georgia. Soviet Georgia, this is where the, the flag's over top of the country there. And I spent the first uh, seven summers of, of my graduate training uh, working there, uh, doing archaeology there. It's a, it's a two million year old site, 1.8 million years old, old site, fossil site. Uh, and it's a really exciting place to work. And, um, you know, again, 
you look at that and you maybe you see a, a kid on holiday, but uh, I, I, the tear in my eye isn't just because of the full head of hair in that picture, it's because about an inch beneath the surface there uh, where I'm digging, the next couple days after I left, uh, we found that right there. Really cool stuff coming out of the ground there. This was skull five because, you guessed it, there were four other skulls. Uh, found over the years there. And Dimenisi is a really exciting place to work because of, of how old it is and where it is and the kind of things we find. And so I was enthralled to be working there. And it's totally cool. I was just wanted to understand our, our species evolution, how our bodies get to be the way they are. And this, this captured, Dimenisi captured a really important point um, in our evolution. And so just to give you a little bit of a, of a sort of ground, you know, this, the framework of our evolution, uh, humans split from chimpanzees around, anybody know? You don't look at the slide. Anybody know how, how far along, how far back did we switch from chimps and, and uh, bonobos? Anybody know? Huh? Four? Four million years. Do I hear five million years? Six million years. Do I hear six million years? It's seven million years. Seven million years ago, we split from the chimps and bonobos. And the first early hominins for the first two million years, we just look very ape-like. We're sucking Africa. Uh, the second two million years, same thing. We've got um, Australopithecus in the second two million years. Uh, things like Lucy. Who's heard of Lucy, right? You've heard of Lucy. So that's, she's kind of around three and a half million years there. Um, but about two, uh, you, who loves Lucy? Somebody loves Lucy? Good. I love Lucy too. Uh, about two million years ago, we begin to see the stuff that we found in Dimonisi, which is the earliest, uh, earliest members of what we call the genus Homo, right? Our genus. We're Homo sapiens, right? And what's cool about the genus Homo is you see a little bit bigger brain, uh, more complex behavior, stone tools, some eating meat and butchering animals. Um, but importantly, what you see is a branching out all over the world. And what does that tell you? That tells you that these guys are ecologically clever, sophisticated, right? Um, they only had brains about half the size of ours still, so they weren't as sophisticated as we are, but they had made the ecological jump, right? They kind of jumped the fence, and they weren't confined to one kind of forest or one kind of landscape anymore. They could be successful anywhere. And that's kind of the hallmark of the human species, right? We're, we're a, a weed. We grow anywhere. And that starts uh, at two million years ago with the origin of the genus Homo. And Dimonisi, where I worked in Georgia, was the first fossil site Ever, it's the ear earliest fossil site ever found outside of Africa. So it represents that first explosion of our lineage all over the globe. So it's an exciting place to work for that reason. Um, humans, Homo sapiens, our group, we're only about 300,000 years old. So we're just one of the, we're just the last, latest twig um, of this big tree uh, called the genus Homo. And um, we are the only ones alive right now, but for most of our species evolution, there would have been a couple other species of Homo around, like Neanderthals, if you've heard of them. Uh, Homo erectus was around a little bit, kind of lingering in Asia. Um, so we weren't, we weren't alone until pretty recently. Okay, so that's a little bit of ba evolutionary background for you. Um, what I want to focus on for today is the fact that this last crucial chapter of our evolution, this genus Homo, the, the important behavioral ecological piece here is that these guys are hunting and gathering, right? The hunting and gathering life, lifestyle is the genus homo lifestyle. So we're not just eating plants, not just eating meat, but that mixture of hunting and gathering is what sort of made us successful, made us so ecologically flexible and clever and got us out all over the world because it's a really um, flexible, dynamic, adaptive lifestyle. All right. so. Throughout my graduate training and then into the early part of my uh, career as a, as a professor, um, I became really fascinated by this question of, of how does this last chapter of our evolution shape the way our bodies work today? And specifically, you know, it, as it probably is obvious to anyone who, in, in this room, um, our recent lifestyles, right, this, this sitting around drinking lattes and you know, God knows how it's in that drink. I don't know. It's something funny um, and calorific. Uh, you know, melted cheese and fries. These things are really recent phenomena, right? Driving instead of walking, really recent phenomenon, right? So these zoos that we've built ourselves, like Raleigh or any other city, any, any other part of the developed world, uh, 
it's a really strange way to live, okay? And it's very much divorced from the hunting and gathering lifestyle that we used to live in. And so it raises the question, right? Are we getting, uh, is, is that big difference between the way that we evolved and the way we live now uh, possibly bad for us? Does it make us sick, right? It's good for us in a lot of ways, right? I wouldn't want to go back to the Paleolithic myself. I like, well, I like watching football for one thing. I like beer. So there's lots of things I like about this lifestyle. But are there things that about it that, are, are, that aren't great and are making us ill? And this is an idea that's been in public health for a long time, uh, since at least the 60s, this idea that modernization uh, is making us sick, leading to things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, maybe increases in some kind of cancers that we didn't used to deal with, but we deal with now because of this mismatch between our current environment and the environment we evolved in. In fact, people call these kind of diseases like heart disease, type 2 diabetes, they, sometimes they call them mismatch diseases because there's this, they, we think they stem from a mismatch between the way we evolved and the lifestyle that we have today. All right, so that's, that's kind of the background. And even in medicine today, and I know this because I talk to clinicians all the time about this stuff, this is about as far and as sophisticated as most evolutionary thinking goes um, in public health. It, we know it's important. You know, if things aren't working today, maybe it's because it's not how it used to be in the past. And then we you know, look at a far side cartoon about what cavemen used to do, call it a day, right? Um, that's fine, I guess. But what I like to try to do with my research is sort of push beyond that and ask the question, okay, if we think that our evolutionary past really is important to understand, then how much can we understand about it? What can we understand about the lifestyles of our hunting and gathering past to figure out the way our bodies evolved? And so um, I've been doing that with a lot of colleagues by looking at living populations of hunter gatherers, right? So they're not like trapped in, you know, they're not, they're not time machines, they're not trapped in amber, but these populations are more like the Amish or another pop other populations that just hold on to their old ways and, you know, because uh, they're proud of them, they like their, their cultures. So they, they keep these old traditions, um, and because of that, they've become sort of ways to, to ask the question, what does hunting and gathering do to our bodies? How, do, how, how is health and physiology, what's it like in these societies? And I'll just jump right to a punchline right away, which is that we know they're really healthy. So hunting and gathering populations don't get heart disease, they don't get obese, they don't get type 2 diabetes. We know they're really healthy. So then the question is why? What is it about their lifestyle that's so different than ours? And, and how is it that, you know, can, can we, besides just noticing that they're healthy and knowing that they have this lifestyle, can we actually draw conclusions and bring things home to implement here in Raleigh or other parts of the developed world to sort of you know, take their healthy parts of their lifestyle back home? Okay. And we can ask the question this way too. If we, if we evolved as hunter-gatherers, how does modern life changed? in ways that make us sick. And so I've worked with about three different populations now, uh, collaborations with two populations in South America, but I've been on the ground in the field uh, with a third population called the Hadza in Tanzania, going out, right, rather than looking at the far side cartoons, actually going out with these populations, living with them for a while, trying to understand what their lifestyle's like and what their health and physiology are like to understand, you know, our, ourselves and our bodies. Um, I'm only going to talk about the Hodge work today because I don't want to go overly long with all this stuff. Um, also, it's, it's where I've spent the most amount of my time and, and have had the most fun. So just to give you kind of a, a, a day in the life snapshot of what this is like what to live a hunting and gathering lifestyle, um, I'm going to give you a, a day in the life of the Hadza. Sound fun? Right? Everybody got their passports? We're going to Tanzania. Um, so Tanzania is... Oh, I'm told this thing will have a, uh, eh? look at that. That's technology, people. You don't get that in a hunter-gatherer camp. No, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, that was, that was funny. She's acting like a cat going for the, I like that, for the laser pointer. Okay, so um, this is Africa. This is some vice presidential candidate's favorite country. Uh, and it's uh, there in northern Tanzania is where we work. So you fly into uh, Kilimanjaro Airport, you take uh, the paved road, 
What's the Jeff Foxworthy thing? You turn off the paved road. Uh, we, you go to the Karatu on the paved road, turn off the paved road, and head out towards Mangola. Then you just drive. When the road runs out, you just keep driving into the savannah for a while, like half a day, and you end up at a Hadza camp. Um, so the Hadza live in that area around Lake Yasi in northern Tanzania. This is a Hadza camp in the morning. Um, who here has young children? Anybody have young children in the audience? Because if you had young children, you're, you're not here, right? Trick question. Okay. Well, I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I can tell you I know the look in that mother's eyes right there because it's six in the morning, and she's like, geez, I just, oh, my God, go play with your brother. Um, so this is morning in the Hadza camp. You can see they live in these, these grass houses. Um, they don't have any electricity. They don't have any tool. Uh, uh, they have tools that they make themselves, like axes and, and stuff. They don't have any uh, tech, uh, motorized or electric technology, though. No electricity, um, no, uh, no domesticated crops or domesticated animals, OK? Um, it is a truly a hunting and gathering culture. And like I said, they're kind of like the Amish. Uh, they know about the outside world, but they're really proud of their cultures, and they, they hold on to them. And it's, it's wonderful that they do. Um, and it provides, of course, an opportunity for us to, to understand what this lifestyle is like. Uh, so when we go and work with them, I collaborate closely with uh, Dr. Brian Wood, who's pictured here. Um, Dr. Brian Wood is at UCLA. He's a, a Hadza expert, bar none. Um, he's been studying their culture and ecology uh, for years now. And so he's a, if, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have this work. So I just want to make sure I, I point him out and credit him for this stuff. Uh, we set up camp, okay? We live in tents. Whatever we do, any science we do, has to fit in the back of a Land Rover, right? There's no town nearby. You can't plug in. We've learned a lot about solar technology out here and what you can fold and put in a, in a Land Rover. Um, so we run our computers off of solar. Any samples, any biological samples we take, we have to put in liquid nitrogen, okay? Because uh, there's no way else to keep them cold. Um, and and we live with the Hadza. We, we, they're uh, generous enough to let us follow them around and sort of see what life is like and, and measure things and study things. And so we spend a lot of time on foot walking along with them out on focal follows. And uh, we pair that with some physiological measures that we do to look at health. All right, so what is a day like for the Hadza? Okay. Uh, well, women wake up. Well, everybody wakes up about 6 a.m., about crack of dawn. There's no lights, remember, so when the sun's up, you're up. When the sun's down, you kind of aren't out anymore. Um, and women will go out in groups uh, because they, you know, to, to forage for, uh, to plant foods. So berries and tubers and um, any other plant foods. Uh, here's a Hadza group of women out for a walk. Um, you never leave home without your digging stick if you're a Hadza woman. Uh, this is a hale and hearty, probably 75-year-old woman out um, walking miles every day. I want to point one thing out. You notice this? You know what that is? Anybody notice? Do you see what that is on her arm? What is that? Anybody know? It's a GPS. Yeah. That's one of the ways that uh, we work with them. We say, hey, would you mind putting a GPS on? So we know how far they go every day and how many steps they take and all that stuff because they're, uh, we give them this, these things to wear. They're super cool folks, um, really fun to work with. Uh, super generous with their time. Uh, here's uh, a Hadza woman picking berries, another one digging tubers. So they eat a lot of tubers. Uh, who here is following a paleo diet these days? Good, let's talk about those people. Um, there's a lot of paleo diet stuff out there that says, oh, you know, if we were really paleo, you wouldn't eat any, any starches or carbs. And all I can say is if you have a low-carb diet and that's working for you, keep with it. That's, I have no problem with anybody's diets. But to argue, that, to, to say that a uh, hunter-gatherer diet is low-carb is kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, the Hadza, as an example, eat tons of carbs because they eat lots of, of starchy vegetables and also honey, as we'll see in a second. Um, so, yeah, big bacha tubers there, uh, baobab fruits they eat as well, and berries. All right. Uh, anybody know why... Hadza women like to go out in groups. Why, do they, why don't they go out by themselves? Because they're not sociopaths that want to be alone? Predation? A little, yeah. So they're, so they're worried about, so safety. So somebody said predation, they're worried about safety. It, it is safety. What do you think they're most worried about? What's, what's the animal on the landscape that they're most 
worried about? What do you think? Lions. How many people vote lions for most? There are lions on the landscape, absolutely. Um, any, some snakes. Who wants to vote for snakes? Most dangerous. Hippopotamus. Hippopotamus would be. It, it kills more people in Africa than almost any other animal except for mosquitoes, which is that's, that's absolutely true. Um, no, what they're most afraid of is this guy, right? You know, um, in the Planet Earth special, who's seen the Planet Earth special, the first one that came out, and the little baby elephant gets killed by the lions? We watched that. We watched documentaries with the Haza when we go out there because they love it, and we love it too. We put them on the laptop and watch them. Don't tell anybody. We probably didn't, don't have the rights to do that. Anyway, we do it. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, yeah, so we watched that scene where the baby elephant gets eaten by the water hole by the lions, and the Haza are like, yeah. <laughs> Ugh, got him. Because, you know, they, hate, they don't like elephants. Uh, because they can't kill elephants, and elephants will kill people. FYI. Um, that's your public service announcement for the day. There are lions out there as well. Lots of things that can kill you out there. Uh, and so you need to be clever and sophisticated and smart to be a hunter-gatherer. And part of that is, if you can go out in a group, you go out in a group. Because why would you be dumb and go out by yourself? Um, so the men go out by themselves. Uh, and that's not just because they're dumb guys, it's because they hunt all day and they tend to think, and I, they're probably right, that they're more successful if they hunt by themselves because they stock up on it, they stock animals very quietly and, uh, and they hunt with bow and arrow. So a Hadza man will make a, a bow, like he's holding there, make that a bow by himself with a knife. Um, he makes his own arrows, takes a long time to make these things. The bows are incredibly powerful. Who here likes to archery shoot, anyone? Right? How many pound? What, what's what's your draw? What, what, what you don't? What's your poundage? Your your draw weight? Huh? Eight or twelve pounds? Is it a okay? Okay, that's that's a little bit lower than most people's bows, but that's okay. No judgment. These guys, they're they're uh, it's a cheap bow. These guys draw about um, eighty pound bows. Yeah, it's almost like doing. They can do like a one arm pull up every time they draw the draw the bow. It's impressive stuff. It'll, make it, it'll humble you if you try to draw a Hadza man's bow, I'll tell you that. Uh, they get big animals about once a month of hunting, right, every 30 days or so. I mean, it's really variable. Uh, they'll get smaller animals like this dik uh on the right more, more often. Um, when they get their meat, they don't have any refrigeration. They don't smoke it, so they cut it into strips and hang it from trees and wear it on their heads for fun. Uh, and so if you walk into a Hadza camp after they've got a zebra or something really big, it smells like a butcher shop. And there's just like this, just like meat hanging from the trees everywhere. And everybody in the camp will eat it. So they, all, they share all their food. That's a, a hunter-gatherer hunter universally. do a lot of sharing, right? Everybody's kind of equal. Everybody shares. No, and and it's, that's the rule. That's the cultural rule. If you're caught not sharing, it's, that's bad. Um, Hods and men also go for honey. So let me show you this. There's a, you see these, these trees here? What kind of tree is that? A baobab tree, that's right. It's like the in Le, P in Le Petit Prince, is that the, is that the children's thing? Um, and you can see maybe that this baobab tree here is all scarred up. To get a sense of how big these are, that's a Hadza man right there walking by it. These are big, big trees. And there's, the bark is very soft. You can, with a hatchet, you could almost bury the head of a hatchet just dead in there. And so what they use, they, they, they always go out with your ax. You, you know, you guys never leave home without your keys and wallet. They never leave home without their ax and bow. Um, and so he's got his ax there, and, and they can actually pound. They cut little segments of other branches of other trees, and they pound them in like, like rungs to climb up these baobab trees. And they, they hack into the limbs of these baobab trees because the, the bees in that part of the savanna, there's a couple different species, but they all have their hives um, in the hollows of, of dead, dead branches. Um, and so, I guess it doesn't have to be a dead branch, but it has to have a hollow in it, and the, and the bees will live in there. And so they, they'll go up into this tree, they'll take a smoky ember with them, smoke out the bees ch as, after they've chopped into make a hole, and they just get the bejesus stung out of them, and they collect a lot of honey. Uh, you see this, the bucket on this guy's back, right, he's carrying up there. That's, he's, not, he's not overcompensating, that's actually, he'll fill that with, with honey. Um, and and he'll bring it all back to camp. About 15 to 20 percent of the diet for the Hadza is just honey, which is just sugar. So again, the paleo guys who say the hunting and gathering doesn't have any sugar in it are not right about that, that, that point at least. Okay. Um, 
kids are running around all day being kids. Uh, they collect water. They collect some firewood. These, uh, they'll even bring back some small games sometimes and share with everybody too. These guys, these kids came back and were very proud of the hyraxes they shot and are sharing them. Um, and uh, yeah, and, so, and sharing again, I just want to make this point, sharing food is a really big piece of hunter-gatherer culture. And that's the true for the Hadza. It's true everywhere. It's true tonight, right? What are we doing? We're sitting down, and okay, the economics are a bit different. You had to pay for your beer. But we, we, you've never had a big event in your life. You've probably never had a day go by, I hope, that you haven't shared a meal with somebody, right? Other apes don't do that, right? If, if chimpanzees had a science cafe, it would last five minutes, and there'd be a fight, and everybody would have to leave because it'd be really bad news. Okay? Uh, humans can do this. Even though I don't know you guys, you don't know me, you don't know each other, but we're always happy to sit here and quietly eat with, you know. It's a unique human thing, and it, and it changes the dynamics of how we get our calories, how we use our landscapes, um, and it's a really important piece of, 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 the, of the puzzle, the human puzzle, and an ancient piece. Sharing food sets us back, it goes back about two million years. Now think about it. Hunting and gathering right? Hunting and gathering. It's not hunting and then over there somebody else, another group is gathering. No, we're all, we as a group, some of us hunt, some of us gather, and we share the food. So hunting and gathering is inherently a sharing, um, a sharing way to make a lifestyle, uh, make, a, make a living. This is a Hadza grandmother uh, sharing food that she brought back uh, with her chubby, happy grandson. All right, so that's a day in the life of the Hadza. Happy to talk more about them. Uh, but let's get to a little bit of science, and then I want to hear from you guys uh, your thoughts on all this stuff. Um, like I said, we, Brian Wood and I and Dave Reichland have spent the last few years uh, working with the Hadza specifically to understand their health, their physiology, how their bodies work in this lifestyle, this landscape. And we've come to some pretty surprising uh, findings. Uh, the first isn't surprising at all, and that is... No matter how you measure it, the Hadza are incredibly physically active. So this is a graph, this is a chart of the minutes of what's called uh, moderate and vigorous physical activity each day. So basically anything that's as, as intensive as walking or more, all right? So uh, standing like this is not moderate and vigorous physical activity, but if I walk around a little bit, I, I might get there. And anything that intense or more would count and I, there's not a, the scale's missing off this, but the Hadza get about two hours. If you add it up over the course of the day, not all at once, but if you add it over the course of the day, they get about two hours of moderate and vigorous physical activity a day, so walking or more. Um, do you know how much, what the number is for uh, most Americans? Anybody? How many minutes a day do you think you got of, ma'am, how many minutes a day do you think, today do you think you got of moderate and vigorous physical activity? You no idea. Nobody has any idea. Five? Fifteen? Fifteen would be about normal. Yeah, fifteen is about, is about typical. So the, the, the punchline is that um, the Hadza, a typical Hadza, gets as much physical activity in a day that you and I will get in a week. Okay? Very physically active. No big surprise. You saw what the lifestyle's like. Um, they, and, and just like we know from other hunting and gathering groups, they don't get sick. So this is one measure of, of cardiovascular health. This is your blood pressure. And if we look at um, adults over uh, 60 years old, so this is just those older adults, um, in the U.S., about 65% or more of adults have hypertension, have high blood pressure. With a Hadza, it's less than 30%. And their blood pressures don't rise as they age, right? They, they just basically stay flat. A, hand, a couple of them will get moderately high blood pressures, but it's very, very rare. So very healthy. Um, and not surprisingly, they never become obese. Um, the cutoff, basal, the body mass index, which is that ratio of how much you weigh to how tall you are, um, that ratio, if it hits 30, anything over 30, we consider that overweight. I've met exactly one overweight Hadza woman in my lifetime. Uh, she was at 30.1. Uh, more than half of the U.S. population is over 30 BMI. Okay, so, all right, so this is a place to find out, to understand how this all works. Okay, how, does, how do you stay that healthy? Man, if we could do that, if we could bottle what they're doing and bring it back to Raleigh, 
or any part of the West, we would do wonders for public health and active, healthy years of living. All the, we could do it if we could find out what the, what the secret sauce is that keeps them so healthy. And so one thing we wanted to test was this idea that it, it, it might change the way they burn calories, right? Being this active might make them burn tons of calories. And if they burn tons of calories, then they, those calories can't accumulate as fat. They'll never get obese. Oh, that's true, they don't get obese. And maybe that's why they keep their hearts healthy and everything else, right? Reasonable hypothesis, everybody understand the hypothesis? We're gonna test, we're gonna test if the Hadza burn more calories than you and I do sitting around. Make sense? Okay. Um, and this is an idea that's been in public health, I should mention, for a long, long time. Um, we never had any, any measurements of how many calories hunter-gatherers spend every day, uh, but it was always assumed because they're so active, they must burn tons more calories than you and I do, and that's why they never develop these diseases of, of civilization. Well, so Brian Wood and Dave Reichlin and I uh, decided to go test that idea. Nobody had ever measured daily energy expenditures in, that's what we call it, calories, the, the total number of calories you burn every day, we call that daily energy expenditure. Nobody had ever measured that in a hunting and gathering population. And part of the reason is because it's really hard to do and it's expensive. Uh, so it took us a while to get the funding to do this, the, the, the support from the National Science Foundation to do this, and we use this, this approach um, that's called the doubly labeled water approach. I'll get into the details if you want to, but here's what it does. It, it, it tracks, we, we drink isotopes, so this guy here is drinking, oh, I don't know, about $800 worth of isotopes right now. Um, <laughs> and then, so that, that's, me, that's me going, oh, dear God, don't spill it because we don't have any extras in this. Anyway, we, we did this for th about 30, now we've got a data for about 50 individuals. You drink that isotope uh, enriched water, totally safe, we use it all over the world all the time in the West. Um, but we can use those isotopes like tracers and, and by, by getting urine samples over uh, several days, we can actually calculate how many calories your body burns very precisely um, and we can get a 24 hour, you know, a daily energy expenditure for you measured very precisely, very reliably. Um, this is the gold standard way to do it, the gold standard measurement. And so everybody knows what the hypothesis is, right? The Hads are so active, they're gonna burn a lot more calories every day than you and me, right? Here's what the results look like. Merp. Totally shocked, totally surprised. I've boiled it down for you here to just a, a simple chart, but I, I promise you, we looked at this in every different way we could, and no matter how you slice it, the Hadza have exactly the same energy expenditure as you and I do. And by the way, how many calories do you think you burn every day? What's an average amount of calories burned every day? Don't, don't look at that for a second. How many? 2,500. So for a, a, a typical male, is more like 3,000, actually. Um, women burn about 2,500. The 2,000 calories a day on the back of your nutrition labels is, is bogus, but that's a whole other talk. Um, but here we have, so about 2,500 calories a day for the US, that's absolutely right. And for the Hadza, um, just about exactly the same number, right? That's not a, we, we wouldn't say that's a statistically significant difference, that's not a meaningful difference. It's the same as you and me. So that's really shocking, and we discovered this about six years ago now, and we've been following this up ever since, and I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of charts and graphs, we can do that some other venue, but we all have beer, so there's a limited amount of, of uh, numbers you can show with beer, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's true. Uh, and so what I'll just tell you is we followed this up with other, other populations, like the Chimani and the Schwar, the, the South American populations I showed you in, uh, pictures of earlier. We've looked at this uh, in other species, because it probably isn't just a human thing, it seems like it's, it's everywhere. Um, and no matter where we look, what we find is this really astonishing thing. No matter how active you are, um, if you're really physically active, or much more sedentary, it doesn't end up affecting how many calories you burn every day. And that's because, and we're trying to unwrap, unravel this science behind this, but it seems to be that your body, if, you be, if you're really physically active, right, and your body adapts to that lifestyle, it does that by changing the way it spends calories on other things, right? So as you're sitting there, your body is busily at work on your immune system function and reproductive function and uh, 
inflammation and, and, and uh, stress response and thermal regulation, all these things, right? Every organ system in your body, digestion right now, if you just say, it, every organ in your body is taking away burning calories. And what we think is those organ systems can sort of turn themselves down a little bit and collectively make a lot of room to, to, to sort of absorb the costs of those high activity lifestyles that we see with the Hadza and other active populations. And so what it seems to be is that energy expenditures, the to your daily energy expenditure is, is something that your body tries to regulate pretty closely, almost like body temperature or blood glucose level, right? You can perturb it a little bit. Day to day, you might perturb it here or there. If you run a marathon tomorrow, yes, you're gonna burn more calories tomorrow. But over time, your body adapts to, to lifestyle to try to keep energy expenditures kind of in check. All right, what that would mean then is that we sh need to think about diet and exercise not as sort of two pieces of the same thing. They're not, they're not just two sides of the same coin, right? That's the typical public health message, right? How do you stay healthy? Oh, diet and exercise. As though they're interchangeable, right? As though you can run enough to earn your donut, right? How, uh, or you can try to outrun a bad diet, that kind of thing. Um, what I think we need to, to do is think instead about diet and activity as two different tools that have two different jobs, right? Diet seems to be the most important thing to, to, to focus on for managing your weight. Exercise is what is important for all the other aspects of your health. I mean, it, the high activity levels that we see with the Hadza probably are why they have such healthy hearts, why they age so healthily, right? So. Exercise and diet are kind of two sides, not, not, not two sides of the same coin. They're two different tools that have two different jobs. Um, good. I think I'll stop there and let's talk about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So, if you've been to the Science Cafe before, you know how Q&A works, but for those who haven't, I'll have a microphone. Katie will have a microphone. You will wave at us throughout the whole Q&A period when you got a question, and we'll bring a microphone over to you, and we'll start the discussion that way. So uh, I'm gonna head, oh, I see lots of, there's popcorn over here. Everybody wants to be healthy. But I think we'll start, yeah, we'll start right over here. I asked two questions. One on language, how did you speak with uh, Ozzy? And second, uh, Olympic athletes, the, the story people tell about them seems to be different from what you're reporting. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the, the answer to the first one is Swahili. So uh, in that part of Africa, the East African coast called the Swahili coast, uh, the, the, all these different populations, and there's hundreds of them, all have a tribal language that they would speak at home, uh, but then they have a, a trade language that they can speak with anybody around. And so we, Swahili is that trade language there. And so we learned Swahili to work with them. Um, I speak a very small number of words of Hadza. It, it's uh, it's not a, a language you can practice very often here in the States, but Swahili is easier. Um, the second one is, that what, is what I have come to, to, to know as the Michael Phelps question, right? How can it be, you know, how can, how can they, everybody spend the same number of calories? I've heard that Michael Phelps burns 10,000 calories a day. Um, the short answer is that you can, you can push this energy expenditure ceiling for a bit, for a little bit. And so when he's in his training cycles, he probably is burning thousands of calories a day. Uh, people who are riding the Tour de France can burn 6,000 calories a day. So you can do it for a while. Um, you can't do it forever. And actually, I think this is the, the sort of metabolic limit on what is possible is one of the reasons that we have to have an off season. It's why athletes can't do it all year round. Um, and I think if you add to that the fact that, you know, the reason that there's only one Michael Phelps is that it could be that some people can sort of cheat that ceiling and, and maintain it an extraordinarily high level of expenditure for a longer time than, than you and I might be able to do. But in general, I think they, athletes can do these higher expenditures, but not forever, for periods of time. How often do they deplete their environment and have to move their village? Uh, they don't move villages very often. Uh, they move between camps, for, so any individual might move between camps very often. Um, I've run across, across guys, uh, this stuck with me. He said, um, I said, oh, you used to be in that camp over there. He goes, yeah, my mother-in-law moved to that camp and I had to, uh, 
<laughs> no kidding. So, like, you know, this thing is the, when you live with these guys, you know, you, initially you're struck by the differences, and then you, very quickly you're sort of struck by the similarities. Life's the same everywhere. Um, they, uh, they don't seem to be, they don't seem to, to exploit resources heavily enough to actually really beat them down. Um, they are more likely to switch what they're, ex you know, what they're eating s because of seasonally what's, what's in season or not um, than, than it is because they've depleted an area. Tubers, they can always get tubers. Honey, they can always get honey. Game comes and goes with the rainy season, sort of is, uh, you know, not a, it's never gone, but it kind of ups and down with the rainy season cycle. Um, the short answer is I don't, I think this is a really sustainable way to do it. I mean, it's a pretty low population density. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, their lower rates of uh, type 2 diabetes and so on. I wonder if you also looked at uh, their mental health issues, whether they suffer from same uh, depression, etc. That's a great question, the mental health issues. Um, it's really hard to know that for sure, and to know about health, mental health, because a lot of the surveys we use to assess mental health have to be culturally validated, right? So if the, the typical survey that I might ask you, uh, you know, about to assess your mental health might not really ring true with somebody from a very different culture. And so um, because of that, it's hard to, I, I don't know that we have a, a really accurate picture of it, but I can tell you my sense. My sense is that mental health issues are, are much less of a, you know, m mental, mental illness seems to be much less common there. Um, and I, you know, they live outside with their friends and family. Inequality is very low. Uh, they don't have a calendar or an alarm clock or a watch. They don't know how old they are, right? I mean, they, they know that they're old or young or whatever, but they don't know, they don't have a number for it. And so um, I think a lot of the stressors that kind of get to our mental health aren't there. And maybe that's another thing to learn from these guys. It's, maybe it's not just the tubers. Maybe it's, you know, and the exercise, maybe the other aspects that are something to learn from too for health. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, one is, how do you separate their lifestyle and their genetics from not encountering the chemical load that we have in our synthetic environment? And the other is, um, I work with Montagnard people here. Let's and with Montagnards from the highlands of Vietnam, and they are hunter-gatherers. Um, they over there have a very low, I mean, all the same rates yeah. that you're talking about, but it's mostly because the sick ones die in the first six months to, I mean, you know, before yeah. the first year of life or in, in um, you know, in the first five years of life. So the ones that do survive are very healthy. When they get over here and start having, we start keeping those babies alive that are not healthy, then they have a lot more incidence of the kinds of diseases that we have. Are you seeing that? Yeah, no, th those, are, those are two important questions. Um, in terms of the chemical exposure, I, I don't know uh, how you could, I mean, I, I think there are so many aspects of their lifestyle that are different that, that we, ha we kind of have to tackle them question by question the way that we're doing, for example, with energy expenditure, to ask a very specific question about one specific idea about how we think things different, seeing if that's true. And we kind of have to have our list of questions to go one by one. I'll say this, they, whenever I come back from the field, uh, my wife always says, oh, you smell like a Hadza camp. She's never been there, but she knows what they smell like because you smell like smoke. Uh, and so, you know, they're not getting the same kinds of, of maybe sort of plastic-based or petroleum-based things that we're getting, but they breathe a lot of smoke. Um, they also will smoke tobacco, for example, uh, when they can get it. So pollution, no, but they get, a lot of, they get a ton of sun and a lot of smoke. So I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to see how that all balances out. I, I just don't know. Um, the second thing I'll say oh, the, about the right is, is it survivor bias. We'd call that survivor bias, right? The, the question about are they healthy because all the unhealthy ones die when they're young. Um, what seems to happen uh, is that the, the big killers uh, for the young are infectious disease. And as far as we can tell, it's your likelihood of getting an infectious disease when you are three years old doesn't have anything to do with the likelihood of you developing uh, cardiovascular disease when you're 60. So unless those two things could be linked, um, I think you're essentially taking a, a large chunk, but a random chunk of the population out 
with infectious disease when they're young, because the Hadza have a lot of infectious disease and a lot of, of early mortality as well. But I don't think that that biases who's left to, to develop or not develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease. It's a really hard thing to, to test, and we, uh, but that's, that's my take on it. Is infectious disease how they maintain a low population density so that they don't overstress the environment? Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're trying to. I don't right. think, yeah, but right. uh, but yeah, that's that's what keeps a lot of these small, not just the Hadza, but a lot of these small scale populations. You know, a mom would, a mother, uh, a woman with the Hadza would typically have, you know, six babies. Um, but the population is more or less stable. So that tells you that most of those babies don't make it to, to have babies of their own. Um, and, you know, infectious disease and early life mortality is a big piece of that for sure. Yep. Thanks. What is their life expectancy? Right. So uh, it depends on how you slice it. If you just ask the, you know, the average age at death, it's in the 30s. But that's because that average is, if you do statistics, right, that average gets dragged down by all these early life uh, uh, death, uh, you know, early infancy deaths. Um, if you make it to 15, you'll probably live into your 40s or 50s. If you make it to your 40s, you'll probably live to your 60s or 70s. And we see women and men in their 60s, 70s, even 80s, uh, it's, it's not uncommon at all. That woman who I showed you towards the end who was sharing uh, that with the, the, the berries that she brought back with her grandson, uh, her name's Mile, she's wonderful, and she is probably 75 in that picture. How often are they eating? That's a question that we'd like to know. Uh, my impression is that it's, um, I mean, they don't, they don't have a structured day the same way that you and I do, right, with a structured lunchtime and a structured dinner time. But still, they wake up and they eat what's kind of left over from the night before. You know, then they, they're not hungry until midday, then they eat at midday. You know, so it, they kind of still do have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner sort of schedule is my impression. Um, but we, I don't have great data on it, and I'd love to know. Yeah. Well, we're trying to figure that out. So, yeah, just a reminder, flag us down. If you've got questions, make sure we see you. Okay, so you, you started with one uh, hypothesis, didn't work out. Yeah. And correct me if I get your your other hypothesis incorrect here. What I got was that you had the idea that um, exercise and diet are separate tools and that diet primarily affects obesity and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. The implication of that is, is that um, exercise then might also affect other diseases. Is there any empirical evidence to that? For example, um, the things that we think about for our culture is things like IBD and um, diabetes and things like that. So is there empirical evidence that exercise is, is the key rather than diet? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, I mean, the, ben the health benefits of exercise are really well established both in sort of cross-sectional population-wide studies and also in prospective studies where you take people who, and you enroll them in an exercise program. Uh, so, uh, you know, that evidence is, is really solid. Um, we know that being, you know, exercising regularly, and, and let me just make this point, you don't have to be an Olympic athlete to get the benefits of exercise. E even moderate exercise, which is sort of getting your 10,000 steps a day or something like that, is enough to reduce cardiovascular dis disease incidence, um, reproductive cancers, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. One of the best defenses against that is is regular exercise. Um, there's some evidence that exercise reduces risks of autoimmune diseases like irritable bowel, and uh, well, depending on what, how you want to think of the ideology of that, um, and uh, you know, other immune system diseases. Uh, we know that exercise reduces stress and stress reactivity. Um, so, you know, if I scare you, which I won't do, but if I scared you, right, the exercisers in the audience, their heart rates would go up less, right? The cortisol levels would go up less. So that kind of scare response you get or that stress response, my response right now, right, being on stage in front of you guys is less, I think, maybe hopefully because I exercise. So, so what's that? And the beer. And the beer. Self-medication is another key piece. Um, so, right. So I hope that answers your question. We, we, we know, yeah. Over diet? So, so, so diet, 
Um, I, I'm not saying that diet won't help your health. I, I don't, you know, I'm trying to, to make a simple sort of message you can take home. Of course, these things are going to interact and overlap. But the diet does seem to have a lot more to do and be a lot more effective for weight management. Um, and obviously, if you eat foods that pollute your body, you know, really processed foods, all kind of weird stuff in them, you can get sick. Um, but, I, you know, I think, I think I'll stick to it, though, that, that exercise for health and, and diet for, for weight, I think, is a pretty, pretty good way to think about it. Um, based on your own, your studies and your research, have you changed any of your own diet or lifestyle or exercise habits? Yeah, I, I drink a lot more beer. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I couldn't possibly drink more beer. Uh, you know, um, I have always enjoyed getting outdoors and hiking and running and, and getting in the mountains. And so um, I just, I, before I even did this research, I just, I knew that about myself that I feel better when I exercise. Uh, and so I can't say it's changed a whole lot of my day-to-day -day life. I'll say that, you know, I've, I've got two little kids now, a six-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. And that has been the biggest change in my daily lifestyle for sure in terms of how much I get to exercise and my diet and everything else. And it, I think that this research puts in the front of my mind um, what kind of, of environment and lifestyle I want to create for them. And also, as things get shaken up for me, you know, this crazy lifestyle changes with having kids, what I want to make sure I hold on to. Uh, so it hasn't been so much of what I want to add to my life as I want to protect that I don't lose. So do they drink alcohol? Uh, not much, no. They, so again, they, you know, they bump up against other groups in their environment, uh, pastoralist groups, that kind of thing, pretty regularly. And occasionally, those populations, those groups might have alcohol to share. And I mean, they, they, they enjoy it. They won't say no. Um, but they don't make it themselves. And so they don't tend to have very much at all, hardly any. No, they, they don't make any of their own alcoholic uh, beverages. Yeah, you, you talked about uh, diet being linked to obesity. Is it the like, calorie restriction primarily, or is it the composition of their diet, or is it the, the natural, or like inherently natural Yeah, sources? so um, when we look across hunter-gatherer groups, okay, they, across the board they're very healthy and very lean. But I can't give you one particular kind of hunter-gatherer diet that we always see. Right? Hunter-gatherers are healthy, and they're healthy on a really wide range of diets. So that's, you know, I was kind of teasing the, the paleo folks a little bit earlier. Um, and it's not just them. A you know, any, any argument that starts with the premise that there's one natural human diet, you lost me, right? Because uh, people eat what's around. And we've done that for two million years. So, you know, if you live um, in an environment that's got a lot of game and not much vegetables, that you eat more meat. If you live with, like, the Hadza do, right, where you can get game, but it's tricky, but you can always get tubers and honey, well, you eat a lot of carbs. And so I don't think it's the macronutrient thing. I think it is that they just never overeat. Um, and they never overeat because, yeah, you know, there's only so many tubers you can eat. You kind of, then you get done. Right? We, we manufacture foods in this environment that are built to not ever let you feel like you're done. Right? I can't have Cheez-Its in the house. Whoever invented Cheez-Its, God love you, but man, it's, it's my, my, I can't say no. It's my kryptonite. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, we engineer these foods that are impossible to ever feel full on, that always make you, you know, once you pop, you can't stop. Right? That's like, that's like, ha, 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 once you pop, you can't stop. No, that's a, that's a threat, not a promise. And we've got to be careful with that, because I think that's why the foods in our environment are so easy to get overweight with. It's hard to say no. I noticed they were all wearing T-shirts and shorts. Yeah, that's right. So they must have considerable contact with other cultures that they trade for this yeah. attire rather than... Weave their own? That's right. I mean, you know, they're just like you and me. They prefer a nice soft cotton t-shirt over animal skins. They can make their own clothes if they need to. Um, but, you know, from their point of view, well, the village is only about a two-day walk. So if you want a new t-shirt bad enough, 
you kind of pack your things and go on a little trip and come back, you know, in a few days with a new T-shirt. Uh, yeah, so they, absolutely, they, they prefer cotton clothing, they prefer rubber sandals, um, and like I said, they're not trapped in amber, they're not, they're not a time machine, you know, they're, they're like, like you and me, they just happen to have their cultural ways that they really like. So are they bartering something? Oh, that's a good question. They, will, they, they often will trade either honey or maybe something that they, they uh, hunt for, you know, wild game or like a zebra skin would be a really, would catch you a lot of, uh, you know, would trade really well in the village. So that kind of thing. Hi. Yeah, uh, a lot of people advocate a vegetarian diet. Now, if you went to the Hods and said you can only eat, you can't eat any meat, could they get enough protein from their natural... Could they get enough protein without animal meat? I think so, because a lot of these wild vegetables and, and fruits uh, with the husk on them, uh, you know, and with the, uh, all the, I think they probably are pretty, pretty proteinaceous. Uh, leaves, for example, have a lot of protein in them. And I don't, so I haven't done the math. We could sit down and figure that out. My guess is they'd be okay, but they wouldn't prefer it. They, they like meat, well, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I, short answer is I'm not sure. But I, I bet probably it's the best answer I can. That's the best I can do. Okay, thanks. I have another multi-tiered question here. Um, have you uh, tried putting an American on their diet, and and it relates to their gut microbiome? Um, they obviously are processing the foods in their environment, and because of the synthetics that we ingest, our microbiome is cut down and altered and all of that sort of stuff, so can we handle it? And yeah, good question. Um, there's been some microbiome work on the Hadza. It's very different than our, you, who raise your hand if you know what the microbiome is? Not everybody. So the microbiome is this ecosystem of bacteria that lives in your guts. They outnumber the bacteria in your guts outnumber the cells in the rest of your body like 10 to 1. So you're mostly not you. Think, think about that. Um, what was the question? Oh yeah, so, if they, so, uh, the, and so you're, the, the microbiome and the, the bacteria that are in your gut, they shift back and forth and who's there and who comes back and, uh, and the diversity and the species that are there. It, it adapts to the diet that you eat. Um, it's one of the reasons that when you travel, you get Stomach problems. It's not because you necessarily caught a bug. It could be because you're eating foods that your 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 bacteria aren't used to. And so, what happened? What would happen if we put a uh, an American on a Hadza diet? Um, haven't tested it. I don't know. Uh, it would be hard to do because you can't get Hadza foods here because we eat domesticated foods, and none of their foods are domesticated. And so, what happens with domestication is you get rid of all the fiber, right? You breed these big fleshy fruits and it to get rid of all the fiber. They eat about five times more fiber than we do every day. So I don't know the answer to your question, what would happen, would we survive? We'd probably be okay. Um, right, uh, oh, I've tried their foods before. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're fine. Um, they're like, not, they're not like Cheez-Its. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> um, but, they, but they're good. Um, but I have never eaten like all only Hadza foods for a week. You know, I, I wouldn't. We don't do that. We bring our own food like it's a camping trip because we don't want to interfere with their day to day. They're, you know. Um, so I, I think if you wanted to test that out, a place to start would be: can you amp? Can you ramp up your your fiber in your diet to like a hundred grams of fiber a day? Right now, you probably get less than twenty if you're a typical American. Can you get five times the amount of fiber that you're eating right now? in your diet, that would be a, a baby step towards figuring that answer out. I, I don't know, interesting question. That's a lot of brand. That's a, that's a lot of brand. A lot of brand. Let's give Herman a round of applause. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Sure, sure, sure. Appreciate it. Great. Cool stuff. Now we know how to live healthy. We saw, he solved it. You can get rid of your Fitbits and your fitness trackers and just eat right and be active. That's not hard, right? Well, thanks to everybody for coming out to the Science Cafe. I hope that you did learn something cool and interesting tonight, something that maybe will impact your life at least a little bit. Uh, we'll be back here next Thursday night with a show that well, might not actually impact your life as much as tonight's did, but we're going to have a lot of fun next Thursday night, too. We're going to do 
a little bit of a pregame for New Year's Eve. So get ready for that. Uh, I'll be hosting along with comedian Brett Williams. So we've got a whole evenings full of fun stuff that we're going to do here on stage and that you'll get to participate with out there in the audience too. So pregame your New Year's Eve with us next Thursday night for the New Year's Eve extravaganza here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. And I hope that you have a great evening. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Good night.